Been digital friends and and uh, somewhat comrades uh, for gosh a, few, a couple of years now, and I've always been a long admirer of Chris uh, Troutner and his developer work, his advocacy. Um, you see him on Telegram; <clears throat> he's got his fingers kind of in everything. He can be your uber technical guru guy that solves all your problems. He can be a philosophical voice of reason. Um, he's also an extremely compassionate guy. There's just so many great things to say about Chris Trotner, and uh, you're going to find out why in our, our conversation today. But before I get too much further into that, Chris Trotner, hey, Trout, thanks so much, man, for, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Yeah, you are the king of intros. i got to give you that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all true. I, I, I believe every word of it, and... Uh, uh, I've watched from afar. I've read. I remember editing your your stuff on Avalanche way back, and um, you know you're just you're a thought leader, and, and you're a guy that that we lean on. And uh, I see you everywhere, and for whatever reason, just I don't know. I kind of take you for granted. You're you're sort of part of the uh, the 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 Bitcoin furniture, and I just sort of assume that you're there. And I was like, you know what? We haven't really <laughs> spoken, and you and. Now, I, I would say arguably the most interesting guy in crypto is Andreas Brecken, if you know anything about him. And oh, yeah, style. huge fan. Yeah, that, that guy is just super fascinating. So I'd say he's, he's up there. Uh, I'd say you're, you're also in the top two or three. Uh, you've, got some, you've got an interesting story, an interesting lifestyle. Um, so let's maybe, let's maybe start there. Um, you take the digital sure. nomad thing kind of the to the extreme, right? Can you, can you kind of tell people sort of how you live? Yeah. You know, um, the digital nomad, madism thing, I, I really respect people who do that. And I actually, I, I haven't, I haven't, like I went through a phase and for people. So we, before we started recording, we talked about a podcast I did a couple years ago with Matt Aaron and he really went into sort of my lifestyle of how I, I, I lived on a boat for about seven years before well, I swallowed well, the way, eight. Just to interrupt you, Matt yeah. Aaron is my nemesis. And that oh. podcast is such an incredible episode. I will <laughs> link to it in the uh, – I was just uh, teasing him, I think, this morning, telling him how wonderful it was. And there's no way I was going to beat that podcast. So we'll link to it in the, uh, in, in the show notes here so you guys can kind of see where Chris was a little over a year ago, but I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that, that was a great episode. But uh, anyway, you said, uh, well, uh, we'll see this, this podcast is young. So we, we, <laughs> let, let's, let's, let's see if we can outdo it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I lived on a boat for about uh, seven years and then I, I bought this piece of property on, uh, on an Island uh, here in Washington state in the San Juan archipelago. And I've just slowly been working on that for the last couple of years. Uh, really, my whole life for the last two years has just been either Bitcoin Cash or working on my property. And those are really like, I'm, I've, I'm kind of single-minded and, and very focused. And uh, I to don't have a least. lot of distractions. Yeah, and you're, um, you spend at least part of your time where you had uh, on a boat, right? Yeah, yeah, I still do. I just, I actually was pretty excited to bring it over here and anchor it up. Uh, I need to give it a little love. But uh, so, so um, before I got back into the crypto space, so to go way back, I was actually like very early with Bitcoin. I, I was so early that I, I mined 50 Bitcoin with my home computer back in 2009. But then I left the space. Wow. Right around like 2014, um, when the the very first drama around the around the the scaling debate, you know, started to started to pop its head up, and, and things started getting nasty. 
I was just, I was kind of more focused on my career. I, I always respected the technology of Bitcoin um, and its potential, but I also always thought it was a long shot that it would survive this long. Um, so that's, and it was when Gabriel Cardona, when he um, made his first YouTube video on the Bitcoin.com channel and started talking about this JavaScript library that he built uh, that can interact with, with the Bitcoin blockchain, I like literally jumped out of my chair and I was like, yes, this is what I've been waiting for. And so I just dove straight back down into the rabbit hole and, and picked up where I left off. And, and, uh, and, you know, a big part of my job when Gabriel hired me was, was developer advocacy. So that's, I'm, I'm stoked to, to, to hear you refer to me as part of the Bitcoin furniture. Cause that's a, that's exactly what I want to be. I want to be just like, like, uh, I, a big part of my job is just talking to technical people, talking to non-technical people, trying to get them um, to talk to one another, um, trying to be mindful of the audience that I'm talking to, because I love talking shop. I mean, I just love it. I love talking shop. But, but you're, you're uh, a natural teacher. And um, there are some people who, so if, and I'm going to, I don't know why I'm bringing up this reference, but uh, I'm sometimes in, in love of my own uh, uh, pseudo profundity here. But if you're into baseball at all, there were two shortstops in the 80s, Ozzie Smith and Gary uh, Templeton. And Ozzie Smith was considered the wizard, so he would do backflips and he would get to balls that no one thought he could get to defensively, and he was just an amazing acrobat. Gary Templeton was a bit of a, they called him the smooth operator, and he was very, uh, you know, he, he made things look so while Ozzy Smith made everything look hard as, as the wizard, Gary Templeton made everything look easy. And I always admired Gary Templeton a little, even though he was, you know, less sexier in terms of the highlight reel, you would see him sort of lay out, get to the same balls and actually more than Ozzy Smith over time and do more, but just make it look easier. You're sort of the Gary Templeton. If I, <laughs> <laughs> if I could extend uh, the metaphor of developers in that you you make these super complex issues seem approachable, palatable, um, easier to understand. And whenever I hear you talk, whether it's on someone else's podcast, um, you make a, a bunch of YouTube uh, clips uh, teaching different things um, in Telegram chat rooms, I always feel smarter walking away. So you're definitely that guy. But I think uh, maybe a, a lasting contribution that you and Gabriel had, I uh, was just looking at it two days ago, is developer.bitcoin.com. You guys more or less built that, right? Yeah, I mean, the lion's share of the work went to, went to Gabriel. Um, and then I, I, I basically took the, the, the raw magic, if you will, and, uh, and, and just, just focused on polishing it. Um, you know, Gabriel really... Uh, has that so he's a visionary i mean i like full mm -hmm. on like period like he is a visionary he sees things that people don't see he sees the next step he's just like steve jobs where like he understands what people want before they do and uh and so i just you know tried my best to recognize that trait and and to and to just polish you know his insights <clears throat> yeah uh, you guys you guys were really 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 good team um uh, shout out to, to Gabriel Cardona. We've got uh, some wonderful podcasts with him over the years as well. So you're, you're living basically on an island. Uh, you're building a cabin. Um, you're one of these self-sustainable guys. Uh, I, I guess a natural question before we get into the reason that I have you on, um, which has to do with privacy and, uh, and Bitcoin Cash and kind of a, a, a discovery you've made through reverse engineering how, how have you sort of found with coronavirus and the breakout and the pandemic, uh, as we spoke before the show, I'm, I'm in uh, Southern California, and so we're extremely pampered here. So anytime there's even the, the mildest inconvenience, we flip out and couch faint and grab our pearls. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the Pacific Northwest has slightly more robust uh, population, and you being a, uh, uh, self-sufficient uh, dude uh, are probably faring, you know, a little bit better. But but how have you found it thus far? Yeah, well, let me start by just pointing out like this. Con I'm gonna 
I think this concept of community is going to keep coming back. It's going to like foreshadow everything we're going to have in this conversation. So um, I wanted to point people if uh, to this, my old blog, sanjuansufficiency.com. And sufficiency is a really hard word to spell. But I haven't touched that blog in years. But in that blog, I talk about, that was like, I documented my journey into living on a, board, a boat and becoming more self-sufficient and sort of my exploration of, of what community is and why it's valuable and, and how to like uh, consciously participate in it. And, and it's those lessons that I brought with me to the Bitcoin cash space when, when Gabriel hired me. And, uh, and, and it gets right back to the, about the COVID um, response. Uh, it, I love living on this little island because the community is, uh, I mean, we just immediately started rallying around one another. Like, okay, like if, if you know, we're thinking about if things even get worse than this, you know, what would we do? And, and even just like in this sort of what I would call, I would kind of call this a little mild uh, in, in terms of how bad things could get. But uh, but it's just been great to have a little posse of uh, of other Islanders that I hang out with and we're all quick to help. We're all low, you know, short, fun. No one's ever what out here in the islands, you're either a millionaire or a pauper. There's there's mm -hmm. really no in between. And uh, and so we all help one another. Um, it's a largely like non-financial type of relationship uh, for most of us. And, and, and that is that sense of community uh, that I love. But yeah, being out here is I, I have been um, the weirdest thing for me is how unweird it is because I'm so uh, focused on just the things that I'm doing and I'm so self-sufficient that I haven't, I went to the mainland for the first time in like three months uh, just like last week and uh, just got some more supplies and, and uh, yeah, it looks like, people's worlds have been turned on their heads but uh, this is exactly the kind of scenario I mean I am a prepper I I, I wear that badge proudly and uh, so I'm I'm in my element right now I'm just like yep this is what I've been preparing for <laughs> yeah yeah and so you said that uh, you were you were somewhat impressed by um, uh, the mainland and, and how they've they've kind of adapted there in in Washington state right yeah, yeah. So one of the I went. I my last supply run was in February. I, I saw you know I, uh, this this sort of pandemic coming from from quite a ways away. I'm I'm kind of sensitive to those things, and uh, like the Ebola outbreak back in 2014, that really scared the crap out of me. I was, mm -hmm. I was ready to set sail for a few months, um, and uh, and then it you know they got it under control. And uh, so what I didn't want was to be on the mainland when everyone else was trying to figure out the new normal. And so going going back uh, last week, it was nice. Everybody's wearing masks. There's like lines on the on the sidewalk to keep everybody six feet apart. Seems like, you know, the system. I am amazed at how quickly uh, the American uh, just in general businesses and stuff have have adapted to this new normal i i did not expect that i did not i thought it was just going to be like mayhem and pandemonium and and no one's gonna like no one's gonna want to shift their mentality at all to deal with the new reality and uh but but uh it's, i'm i'm really impressed with uh what's the word just the resilience of of people uh around around this uh, i'm also you know glad that i was able to do a quick run and get back here <laughs> Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I was thinking as you were talking that, uh, you know, things are moving so fast. Washington State, if people don't know in the United States, as opposed to, to the District of, of Columbia, uh, this is in, we're talking now the Pacific Northwest, it uh, was more or less the epicenter uh, at one point of the virus outbreak in the U.S. And there's... Um, in the in the unfolding narrative of uh, the chronology of how this sort of makes its way across um it, it kind of begins there and there's uh, all sorts of drama uh with a, a a physician a university researcher who just kind of bucks uh, regulators and goes out and she just goes no i'm gonna i'm gonna this is this is something there's there's some there you know there's some there there there's some something we need to do and uh, she just starts uh making her away and, and making these discoveries so you were you were definitely right, <laughs> sort of right at ground zero in the United States. So I guess that's yeah. heartening to hear. That's really heartening to hear. 
Yeah, yeah. Seattle was the hot spot for a long time, and then New York overtake to overtook us just because of their population density. I mean, the virus just spread like wildfire in that scenario. Whereas the Pacific Northwest, I mean, Seattle's a modern city, but um, but it had a hard, the virus has had a hard time like getting out to the outskirts. But but yeah, the the mainland where I come in from is there, I mean, it's made national news with some of the people getting sick. So that's I think another reason why people are yeah. taking it so seriously up here. And, uh, and, you know, but, you know, because, because I've had a significant, I think one of the things I think makes me very different than the average person dealing with this is because of my prepper mentality. I saw this coming from a long ways away. I was totally prepared. Um, there was no fear or reaction, you know, uh, to it. It was, it was, I've, I've managed to be proactive every step of the way. And so to bring this conversation back around to like the earn it act, that's one of the things that uh, I see, like there's, there's just so much stuff happening behind the scenes now because everyone's distracted by COVID-19 and, you know, like the saying goes, uh, politicians never let a good emergency go to waste. That's right. And uh, so the earn it act's been around for a while and I didn't think it was, it had a chance in hell, uh, but because everyone's distracted, uh, it, uh, it's much more dangerous now. And, um, so this is, so, um, this is a piece of legislation that is emanating out of the United States Senate. And we have some politicians in the United States, not exactly known for their, um, their, their love of privacy, uh, for the average citizen and, and chief among them would be Lindsey Graham of, uh, of South Carolina. Uh, he and a, and a group of senators, uh, you know, bipartisan uh, a senator here from uh, my state in, uh, in California, uh, Diane Feinstein, and, and a group of others, some fairly, you know, big heavy hitters, have come forward with a piece of legislation that r- really takes on end-to-end encryption. Um, do you want to kind of, um, like, sort of what, what alarmed you about it when you first heard about it? And... Uh, and uh, why, before we get into specifics of how you address it. Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of the, the sort of the historical setup for all of this is, you know, Facebook did Libra and the politicians weren't too crazy about that idea. And then he immediately, or at the same time, I don't know if it had anything to do with it, but he, he started at, at the big like Facebook developer, or I think it was developer conference. Um, he was like, we need to make Facebook more private. And he had a, like, he, he just like really was beating that drum. Like we got to have better privacy. And uh, so I think the earn it act is largely like a response to both like the, we hate Facebook because of the Libra thing and, you know, privacy is bad, hmm. uh, you know, from a politician standpoint. So I think it's, it's largely a reaction. Um, and it's, it's definitely targeted at the, the larger social media companies, not necessarily Bitcoin or, or anything like that, but uh, that's not to say that those wouldn't have repercussions uh, with, with it. Yeah, yeah, and so they're, they're basically advocating, and it's working its way uh, through Congress now, um, but it's, it's basically advocating, a, I guess, like a national council or panel of about 17 people, uh, give or take, who would, who would more or less issue licenses for tech companies um, to, to enable or, you know, however the, the language would, would eventually be, uh, sussed out, uh, for them to be able to utilize tools like end-to-end encryption in messaging services or on, on their platforms. Um, and they would require, they, they would have to, you know, pass a battery of, of filters and tests according to this, uh, counselor panel, uh, essentially giving, uh, law enforcement and others, a uh, kind of a back door. Um, you know the the pretext, of course, is child exploitation, as it as it normally is, and uh, there's there's certainly you know some very sober and rational worries there. But why would something like that? <clears throat> so why not just sort of give in to what seems like a kind of a reasonable request of of lawmakers and law enforcement to just go well, let's let's go slow with end to end encryption. Like why yeah. why why are privacy hawks you know, looking at this and going, no, 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 no. 
Yeah, this is a uh, this is like you know they say that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. You know, that's a Mark Twain quote. Uh, the and that's largely what's happening here is I mean the battle has been raging in Washington D.C. for the better part of a decade about this encryption thing, and the the thing that the politicians are fighting they think they're fighting the tech companies, but what they're actually fighting is mathematics, and uh, it's just I mean there's there's the obvious like the the canned response is well you can't add a back door for just the good guys because that's a that's a subjective interpretation and the bad guys you know uh, the nsa can't even keep their stuff secret so so th it's just the whole the whole setup to be a backdoor just for the government is like a red herring but also that just on another level the, when i say they're fighting math it's this idea that they can somehow control math or, or bring math to heal to their political agenda and if you go back in history, like encryption was originally like the, the whole concept of encryption, like the, the implementation of encryption in a computer was treated as a munition and it was illegal uh, it, yes. uh, to, to export uh, an encryption algorithm outside of the USA. And so some of these early cypherpunk activists, they started printing the, the, you know, the one or two lines of code necessary to do encryption on t-shirts and wearing them around to just show that like, this is, this isn't something that you can control. It's any more than a sentence in an email somewhere. And, uh, and so it's the same thing. Uh, if, if there is anything that I, I was trying to bring to light with, with the work I did with this BCH encrypt program, it's just that, uh, this end-to-end -end encryption capability is baked into Bitcoin, and it has been for the last 11 years since Bitcoin's been around. So to try and stop it now is, you know, you're you're getting pretty late. You're pretty late to the party. And it this this takes us or takes you and and our conversation to a mutual friend in in Vin Armani, who uh, uh, full circle here has just been on fire uh, with regard to coronavirus and tweeting about it all the time and mm -hmm. uh, he is definitely a, a thought leader and um, you know I, I haven't heard him talk too much about uh, uh, the attacks on E2EE but he he I, I know it's a, a concern of his but he seemingly released a library that triggered something in you um, yeah. can you go into that a little bit and then and then how you connect that back to the earn act yeah, so to, to frame this, uh, so it makes a little more sense, uh, you mentioned the YouTube videos that I put out, and um, and uh, I'm constantly getting helpful advice on how to make my YouTube videos, and I appreciate it, but I think one of the things that a lot of people miss is the, I'm never trying to, like, be like, like, hey, everybody, I made this thing, and here it is, and isn't it perfect? That's never the, my, my whole focus, like, since I got back into the Bitcoin space, the working for Bitcoin.com was uh, being a developer advocate. And a big part of that is, is finding, you know, developers are cats. I, I, I always tell people this, like, developers are cats. You can't herd them like sheep. How do you herd cats? Well, the way you herd cats is you put treats and you invite them to come where you want them to go. And that's how you herd cats. And, uh, and, and Gabriel largely taught me that. And, uh, um, and so a big part of what I do or what I try to do to move the space forward is to, is to understand these developers and their passions and their focuses and also their limitations. And, uh, and so what I try to do with these YouTube videos is usually not to like solve a problem, but to simply uh, take the technology that one developer like kind of got, you know, moved the ball forward a little bit and, uh, and, and, and maybe another developer working on a totally different problem, uh, move the ball forward that and just show how they're related and how, and how like this and, and get the code out there and get other developers interested in, and just helping me connect the dots rather than me trying to do it all myself. And, uh, so in the case of Vin, um, he released, uh, the, this, He's really been digging in the last uh, year into the elliptic curve cryptography that, that is behind the Bitcoin protocol and makes the Bitcoin protocol work. And um, so he, he, has been, he took basically that, the, the core encryption that happens in Bitcoin and he took it and he figured out how to like apply it to actually like encrypting you know, stuff like an e the same way an email would be encrypted. And he focused more on the, um, 
the Bitcoin file protocol, which was developed by James Kramer, but that, that protocol hasn't really gotten a lot of traction. I was actually just talking to James about it yesterday and he hasn't touched that code in over a year. And uh, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, it's just uh, one of the things I think uh, we've learned is that the blockchain's not a good place to store g generic data because it's so expensive and inefficient. Um, but uh, so I just took, I, I pulled out the encryption that, that Vin had worked on and put together and figured out. And I combined that with, instead of using the, the Bitcoin file protocol, I combined it with the memo cache, memo.cache and member.cache. So most people aren't familiar with those sites. Memo.cache is like Twitter. It's the same like kind of idea, except it's on the blockchain. So it can't be censored. And, uh, and it's also permanent. Like, you, you know, people get upset about how Twitter, uh, you can't edit your tweets. Well, you really can't do that when it's written to the blockchain. And then right. member.cache just extended that idea so that you could have, instead of a single tweet, you could do a series of posts and then combine them all into one large post. And so member.cache is, is like Reddit and it's built off the same ideas of memo.cache just taken one step further. And so I'm a big fan of the protocol because it's so simple. It's this on-chain uh, protocol for, for sending messages. So I just applied Vin's encryption to, to, to those ideas. I just, I just connected those two dots. And, you know, immediately I don't, and I didn't at all, uh, see a connection to the Earn It Act and uh, how that might be a foil uh, ultimately in anyone's attempt uh, to, to create, you know, permissioned, uh, or any kind of permanent permissioned, uh, messaging system. But in, in, in did, do you think you, you stumbled onto that conclusion or, or was this something you were heading into kind of directly or did you find it later? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a crypto anarchist and I'm a cypherpunk. And so every time one of these, one of these, uh, you know, uh, bills come through congress that's that's uh you know uh trying to stomp on our either our right to free speech or our right to privacy or both you know I, i'm i'm mindful of them and uh and thankfully in the past uh there's been many bills and they've all been defeated and i just expected the same thing with the earn it act but then when the covid thing happened I, you know i thought wow this is this is really i i mean distracting and and for good reasons and Perfect so it's a time. good opportunity for them to slip this earn it act, you know, behind the scenes. And so I, it, it sort of seeing those two things happen at the same time really made me more aware of it. And so that's why I kind of just gave a tip of the hat to it when I, um, when I was just sharing, you know, what I had built. And you, you make some pretty bold, uh, uh, statements when you, when you release it, I saw it on, uh, our BTC and, uh, maybe in, a. A telegram chat room and you were saying look the, the implications of this are are that you know no one can touch and end encryption if if we do it in this manner um they won't be able to, to i mean they can legislate against anything but it, it will ultimately have no teeth right yeah i mean to put this into perspective it's like it's like let's say they pass some legislation that said that uh bitcoin can no longer use pseudo anonymous addresses you know, like what would that do? Nothing. Like it, it's they're they're just too late to the party. So in a similar way with the end-to-end -end encryption, just uh, you know, it's just they're they're just too late to the party. And so, how does your reverse engineering Vin uh, Vin's um, uh, library idea and uh, the elliptical curve encryption um, come together? <clears throat> like like where do you see it ultimately heading? Uh, do you think people will? Uh, or application devs will put it into wallets or um, I mean, does it, does it necessarily, I guess, depend on more adoption? Yeah. So really what I was trying to do was inspire the, the developers behind memo.cache and member.cache to pick up, uh, to sort of pick, pick it up from, from what I did. And, and they have. Um, I've been in uh, communication with Free Trade, who uh, runs Member.Cash, and he's in the process of of integrating my code into that platform. And um, nice. and it, and I want to point out that um, it, that that other developers on Reddit have pointed out that there there is there is a risk here 
um, by by putting messages on chain, even if they're encrypted, like that might be mm -hmm. fine for today, but down the road, someone might figure out how to decrypt them. And so this isn't necessarily like the best way to go about it. Um, it's, uh, but it is a way to go about it and it's using the tools that are just lying around us right now. And so there's, there's value in that. Um, so it's, it's more inspirational than like the final, you know, thing that like to end all things. Um, this is just one step down the road. I think it makes Bitcoin cash more, just like memo.cash and member.cash, I feel are making Bitcoin cash more useful, uh, giving them utilitarian value. I think this is just one more, you know, feather in that cap of it's like, yeah, here is a little bit more utilitarian value. If, if you are stuck behind the great firewall of China and you want to get a message to someone uh, somewhere else, uh, which is a common problem, because there is a huge, I mean, your listeners might not be aware of this, but I know you are, that there's a huge communication gap between uh, the West and the East Mm -hmm. uh, with Bitcoin Cash, particularly with the developer community and trying to, I've tried very hard to, to, to sort of cross that barrier and it's, it's very difficult. And um, this would be one way where, uh, and this is what I, this is the cypher and punk in me that, that just loves, you know, this idea of, of the blockchain because there's two important aspects to it. One is the encryption and, and that's pretty straightforward. Anybody who's ever encrypted an email, that's the exact same process. The other thing that's not quite so obvious is the content delivery. So if you can encrypt a message, it doesn't necessarily mean you can get it to the person you're trying to send it to. Um, that's where the great firewall of China would say, stop it. But if you can write the message to the blockchain, then any full node that has a copy of the blockchain, which is how they work, will have that content. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's much more difficult to stop than say like stopping an email or stopping a web page or stopping a tweet. Those are fairly easy to stop, but the governments have not figured out how to stop a piece of content from being written to the blockchain. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating implications there. And uh, I, I wonder, because we share so much with BTC, is, is there any advantage to, to doing like why Bitcoin cash? Why, why, why look to it and, and its chain and so on and, and the applications that are being or that have been built on it um, as, a, as a delivery system here? Why not, why not another blockchain? That's a really good question. And I'm sure a lot of people are asking that question. And there's really good reason. So uh, there's a reason why this wouldn't work on BTC. And there's a reason why this wouldn't work on BSV. Uh, the reason it wouldn't work on BTC is because uh, the op return is much smaller. And so one of the big problems I had to solve was how do I break up a message that won't fit in one transaction and send it in multiple transactions and then reassemble it on the other side. And member.cash had already solved that problem, the reassembly problem. So all I had to figure out was the first half of how do I break it up in a way that member.cash can put it back together. And, um, and so that, that problem would be even harder on BTC because the, the op return size is, is smaller and the transaction fee it would be much more expensive because of the transaction fees. Um, and it was just like, it's not a good cultural fit. Um, writing stuff to the op return is, is sort of taboo in the BTC culture. Right. And, uh, and then it wouldn't work very well in BSV because their blocks are so big. Now, the advantage of using BSV is that it could all fit in a single transaction because their op return is essentially unlimited. But um, their blocks are so big that they are actually fairly easy to censor. Um, and uh, whereas, and so I, I'm a fan. I'm personally a big fan of Bitcoin Cash because I feel like we're in the Goldilocks zone of the op return, which is so for people who are unfamiliar with the op return, it's a way to include a text, just arbitrary metadata or text in with a transaction. And so BTC made this decision to make it small. BSV made this decision to make it big. And I think BCH is just right. We, we found because BCH, um, the primary use case for BCH is cash. I mean, it's, it's digital cash for the world. And anything else that it does is not as important as that. And, uh, but, but by, by choosing the size that, that the community chose for the op return, 
uh, it's just right. We can we can send uh, some so, uh, just enough data, and if it's not enough, we can we can sort of chunk it out into multiple transactions and make it work that way. And uh, I really feel like from a from a technological and engineering perspective, BCH has has found that Goldilocks zone. Uh, my mind is racing here with with the implications and. Hopefully it's going to spark, as you say, leaving, uh, leaving devs and, and uh, visionaries little treats uh, and herding these cats uh, towards, uh, towards more uh, uh, permissionless uh, uh, content generation and messaging and all that good stuff. Uh, I think there's, uh, there's a definite need for it. And, and as you say, um, <clears throat> there's kind of a perfect storm uh, uh, brewing right now. Um, going forward, how do we find all things Trout? Uh, Chris Trotner, keep up with what he's doing. Uh, I know you've since moved on from uh, from dot com, and you're you're on to other projects now. What? Uh, how? How can we we find you and and follow you? Yeah, I'm spending the majority of my time these days on a website called fullstack dot cash. So instead of dot com, it's dot cash, which is popular with the Bitcoin Cash space. And I'm I'm really it's just an extension of the work I was doing at Bitcoin dot com. I'm experimenting with a, uh, an or, a foundation I'm calling the Permissionless Software Foundation. And it's, it is largely an experiment, but uh, if, if the experiment bears fruit, it should uh, solve a lot of these funding problems, where, uh, this, this great problem of how do we fund open source infrastructure. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of my attempt to solve that problem. And it uses SLP tokens, and so that makes it really fun to play with. And uh, we're not taking it too seriously at this point. It's just an experiment, uh, kind of just throwing mud at the wall, seeing if it sticks. But uh, fullstack.cash is where people should go, especially if you're a developer. I'm on Twitter, at Chris Troutner, also Telegram, at Chris Troutner. But uh, if you go to fullstack.cash, you can, that's probably the easiest way to, to track me down on these other channels. Boom. Um, he is the, the, the man to kind of keep track of here. Uh, he is a thought leader and uh, someone that uh, just puts everything into perspective. Uh, I really appreciate your voice, man. I, I appreciate your your sobriety. Uh, always willing to uh, to lend a hand, and uh, it was uh, great talking to you finally, uh, officially. And uh, we'll have you back on soon. But uh, thanks so much again for coming on. We appreciate it. You rock, Kelso. Thank you. Thank you.